Hello, mystery fans. My name is Jess, and this is Cam Cat Unwrapped. Today we have with us in the studio once again, Michael Bradley. You know him, you love him. He's an IBPA Benjamin Franklin award-winning author who was here our very first interview, gosh, over a year ago, I think, um, for his book, Dead Air. And now he's here to talk with us about his latest release, None Without Sin. Michael, I'm so excited to have you back. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me back. I really, I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. All week I've been telling Gabe, I'm like, oh yes, we're going to interview Michael again. <laughs> Always such a pleasure. And I know we already went over this last time, but for our newer listeners and, you know, just to, to give our older listeners a reminder, tell us a little bit about yourself. So um, I live in Delaware and um, so I started my career in actually radio broadcasting. So I spent about eight or nine years in radio broadcasting before I realized I needed to get a real job. Um, <laughs> and then moved in and, you know, had to go out and find an actual job that would, would actually pay uh, a living wage. Uh, uh, but uh, I've used my um, used some of my experiences in radio uh, in some of my books, in particular Dead yeah. Air, we spoke about last time. Um, a lot of my radio experience ended up in dead air uh, because it's about a uh, radio disc jockey. Um, so I was able to take some of that and put that into, uh, into that book. Some of those, there's a few anecdotes of that came from my actual experience, uh, a couple little background elements that uh, I threw in there just to, to kind of get my own personal take on it. Um, but uh, so I've got four books out and none of that sin is of course the latest and that one is a little bit different than what I've written before because it's more mystery oriented as opposed to suspense or thriller. So it's, it's a little bit, a little bit of a different type of book for me. Um, you know, as far as when I was, uh, as far as what I've written in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I have this little quote that you and I were talking about beforehand um, that I just wanted to share because I really liked it. I don't even know who said it. You'll have to let me know. Um, but they describe None Without Sin as a vibrant and gripping thriller that will make readers eager for more. And as someone who very much enjoyed the book, I completely agree. It was super gripping. It was one of those books, you know, Cam Cat has this term, unput downable. It was one of those books for me where I was like, I have to know what happens. I cannot put this down. So it was that, very, that actually, very it's funny because that quote comes from an author I met uh, several years ago, Thriller Fest. Um, his oh. name is August Norman. And, ah. and he actually wrote uh, a book called Sins of the Mother. So <laughs> there's this sin connection there between yeah. uh, between us. So, Oh, that's very neat. Well, some of these questions, you guys are probably, you know, you've heard me ask these questions a million times. Michael, you probably remember them from way back when I interviewed <laughs> you the first time. But we're just going to touch on them a little bit, and then we'll get into the more none without sin specific questions. Um, but yeah, tell us about your connection to mystery, <clears throat> you know, thriller a little bit too, because dead air was more thrillery, but yeah. Tell us about your connection to your genre. I, I've always just loved the genre. Um, it's the genre that I've always kind of gravitated to uh, for a long, long time. And uh, you know, with thriller and suspense and mystery, the three genres are really interconnected a lot. There's a lot of crossover between those genres. So it's it, in some ways it's hard to distinguish, um, you know, with thriller, suspense and mystery. There's there's little elements here and there, but they are they all share a very common core, um, you know, with, between the three genres. So it's not it's not an overreach for me to go from writing a suspense novel to a mystery because there are so many common elements between, you know, the different types of books. Absolutely. Uh, but I've always gravitated towards, I've always gravitated towards mysteries as far as what I've read, you know, even when I was uh, younger, um, I was exposed to my first set of mysteries with um, <laughs> Encyclopedia Brown uh, mysteries <laughs> when I was a kid. Um, and then of course, uh, Sherlock Holmes was kind of the, the first I'd say adult type mystery that I got into, uh, particularly with the Jeremy Brett PBS series that they had on when I was, you know, in, in the early eighties. Um, and then I got introduced to, I guess what I would call my first true, first true modern mystery, which mm. uh, is, was a book I found in a, um, 
a used bookstore called Curiosity doesn't uh, Curiosity didn't kill the cat <laughs> I um, love that. <laughs> by, by, an, by an author named M.K. Wren. And it was my first exposure to what would be classified as the amateur detective. Mm. Um, and I just fell in love with it. I fell in love with the book. I mean, at the time that I found that it, it was in the, the mid 80s and the book had already been out for 10 years. So it was already anachronistic. Um, and it even is, I mean, it's even worse now. I mean, there's people smoking in, in cat, you know, restaurants and inside hotels and, you know, in inside buildings, there's people, you know, when you need to call the police, you got to find a pay phone, you know, so <laughs> there's, there's some real anachronisms in it, but, but the core of the book just stuck with me. The core that there's this person who's not a detective, that's not his job, um, and, and he still, you know, he has no authority, but he still goes out and, you know, solves crimes, um, tries to identify who were murderers, digs into the clues and that sort of thing. And I just, I fell in love with that concept, with that first book. And of course, I, I think there's eight or nine books in the series total, um, all of them anachronistic. Uh, just, <laughs> <laughs> she passed away, you know, in the 90s, um, but, you know, her book's you know, they're still out there. They're still available. And, you know, I just just absolutely fell in love with those when I, um, you know, when I first read them. And that that kind of got me down that path of just grabbing whatever mystery I could find, grabbing whatever suspense, um, whatever thriller that I could find, because it just kind of really, really, you know, really drew me in. What you described to me kind of feels almost like noir mystery without the um, without the like actual act of being a detective or the, the occupation of no. being a detective. Is that what that No, means? it's, yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's more of the, um, the environment that the story is set in. Yeah, it's the, the, it's the fact that like they have rotary phones, you know, there's just these, mm. uh, it's because it's definitely not, it's definitely not a new R book series. It is um, just, it is more amateur detectives, normal mystery. Um, but it's just, when you read it, it's like, wow, people are smoking, yeah. in a restaurant, you know, they've got to find a pay phone. What's a pay phone? <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, we're going to have the same problem in 20 years with anything that's written today or yesterday. That's People true. are going to go Google. What's Google? You know, <laughs> you know the, these things are all going to, we'll probably have chips implanted in our heads. It'll be, there'll be no need for cell phones. And it'll be like, what, you know, what's a cell phone? Who, who, who has that? <laughs> um, so, you know, it'll be the same thing in stories, you know, 20 or 30 years from now when somebody picks up, none without sin and reads it, you know, again. <laughs> sure. So. Well, you know, I feel like some of those elements, because we see them so much in media and even in older media, they're almost <clears throat> timeless in that maybe we don't have pay phones, you know, hotels that it's super easy for you to just smoke inside the room, whatever it may be these <laughs> days. We're so familiar with that, that there's this element of I'm familiar. I, I, I'm familiar with it. I, it's timeless. I I know I can picture it in my head super clearly because there is so much media that reinforces it. So that's really, really interesting. I'd never heard the term before, so thank you. Um, but I can definitely see how, even if it's not, I mean, obviously, oh, geez, it not being a detective who is um, taking on the case, it has those elements of, of, of noir mystery. I kind of felt like, um, based on your description, anachronistic. Um, I, I like that word. It's, I, I'm filing it away, away in my head. You're going to be, you're gonna be using word. it everywhere you go now. Every time you talk, open your mouth and talk to somebody, you're going to say anachronistic. And they're going to be like, oh, look who opened up a dictionary. <laughs> and I'll be like, actually, Michael Bradley, award-winning author, taught me that term. <laughs> that, is, that is really cool. And it's I can definitely see how that inspired a lot of your books. Uh, or a lot of, you know, the very like, um, you know, I keep, I, I, obviously it doesn't mean noir mystery, but that kind of element of, um, I mean, uh, of the clear cut mystery of like the, the classic elements, the things that really, you know, tie it together, even if it's kind of unfamiliar, there are things that really ground it in, um, ground those stories in modern day. And I can see how your stories, I think will carry that into the future as well. They're the elements that ground it so that you know that even if it's in the past, it's, it's, 
it's still relevant in my heart. Um, so for your, I'm curious because you mentioned those things for these books, it's so clear. And I've read your CamCat ones. Is that the case for your other books as well? Because you have two other books that you have out before you started um, publishing with CamCat. Are those also mysteries? And do they also have that same kind of feel? So, so they were, um, when I, my first book is a supernatural thriller. So it's got some very, very unusual supernatural elements to it. Um, mm. And the second one was more of a psycho, dark psychological thriller. Ah. So they, they don't, they don't quite have that. I think the first book with the supernatural elements has more of a new Irish feel to it. Cause it's, it's, okay. you know, there's a lot of, it's a, it's a little, it's a little darker, um, but the, the second book is is very dark. Um, it, it, the second book really ended up being uh, kind of one of those books that either you really love it or you really hate it when you read it. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, the, the character, the character, the main character in it is very dark, uh, which was a, a challenge to write. It was he was very difficult to write because of how how uh, he was kind of unlikable to a certain degree. And it was mm. it was there was a lot of challenge in writing that kind of a character. Um, but you know, th- I try to stay consistent, you know, at least with the elements across across the books. I think the one thing that I've I've done more of as I've progressed in my writing is to focus more on character and less on the uh, underlying elements of the world. Like I, mm-hmm. I've tried to start getting away from using a lot of technology. Hey, I'll just pull out my computer and just boom, do this search and boom, there's yeah. every, all the information I could possibly need. Um, I try to avoid that and use, make the books a little bit more character driven, sure. uh, go deeper into the character uh, um, and show them actually show their, their feelings and their sensations and the things that they're trying to do. Uh, Cause I, I don't, you know, although I know I have to have some level of technology in there, I don't want to rely on it, um, sure. you know, to, for every little plot, plot twist and that sort of thing. Yeah. Or to drive the story in any way. I definitely see it, it's very character driven. And like you said, you've given these characters so much character that they, they really can continue to push the story forward. That's so interesting. Um, well, this is a question that we've answered for dead air with your, um, former radio experience, <laughs> but none without sin. Is there any elements of it that are based on your real life? Um, no, actually, they're not really. Um, the only thing that might be uh, that that might you might consider is is the location. So I live relatively close to the location um, that I used as the setting for Dead Air. So it's a fictional ah. version of a real town in the state of Delaware. Uh, but other than that, there's no, there's not really any any personal elements built into this. Uh, I, I was never a journalist, and you know, I certainly didn't. You know, it, it, it's just there's. <laughs> there's not a a personal element as much in this book as, as just the characters and it's more, you know, focused on them and and the mystery. Well, with a serial killer and with such a, you know, distinct calling card, (laughs) I would hope that your experience with that is rather limited, (laughs) Yes, but that makes sense. Of course. Yeah. With dead air, you did have that connection of it being, you know, a radio show host who was the subject of the book and uh, and so I was curious, yeah, how how similar or different None Without Sin was for to you for your life. And you had mentioned, you know, while I'm sure you have done much research, especially on this sin eating ritual um, in order to inform your book. Yeah, you're right. There isn't a lot of technology to drive forward the story and in, in None Without Sin or Dead Air for that matter. But um, what kind of research did you have to do? To, to lend to none without sin. Uh, like you said, a lot of it was about the the concept of sin eating in order to get some of the the, the information right. Uh, there was a lot of location scouting for me because um, uh, I tried I try when I write um, all of my books, I try to incorporate as much true or real landscape as I can. Um, in order to give some realism to it. I mean, you know, Dead Air was set in the Philadelphia area as well as right. some areas in southern New Jersey. And a lot of the elements that were in there, the street names and some of the landmarks were were real and um, did the same thing with None Without Sin. You know, there are a couple st- structures, a couple buildings in the, the fictional version of Newark that actually exist in the real Newark um, mm-hmm. in order to be able to 
to add some realism to the elements. And I, I of course, changed the names of the buildings and changed sure. the names of the companies and things in order to keep from getting a lawsuit. You know, you, <laughs> drop, a cor- you drop a corpse in front of some pizza shop and use their real name. People, they're not going to be happy. So, you know, I tried to, you know, change some of that up. Uh, but if you have read the book and you walk down Main Street in Newark, you can find the newspaper, the building that I've used as the newspaper office location. Oh, wow. Um, you can find there's an old Catholic church on one street that plays a part in the book. You can find that as well um, if you walk down Main Street. So I try to get incorporate as much realism as I can. Um, so for me, it was like, OK, I got to research the idea of the Sin Eater and then I got to research a lot of locations. Yeah. Um, in order to make sure I get those locations right. Sure. Well, I think we did talk about this last time too, but I think that's so neat that you did that. And it lends so much to the believability of the reader. I've never even been to these places, but I'm sure because they were real, you were able to add so much depth to it as far as how it feels to be there. And, and you know, it is very character driven, but even so I felt like the experience felt so real. So I'm sure that that lended to that very well. Um, it also makes it easy to keep track of everything sure. as far as where stuff is set, because, um, cause I, you know, I've, okay, I know this building is here and I know this building is there. Um, I know I've, I, I have a friend of mine who, um, who writes uh, crime fiction and she's created this whole fictional town. And she says one of the hardest parts is keeping tabs between books of where, where this bank was and where that was and where this was, because you know, it's, it's all fictional. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've heard, I just interviewed an author who said they had to draw out a map just to really make sure they could keep track of it. And I thought that was so impressive. And I'm really glad that you did that because it made it feel you know, real and like you really knew where each thing was located and what it looked like. But that sounds like so much more work. (laughs) So I love that you were able to draw from the real world. Now, we did talk a little bit about this in the Dead Air interview, but I'm curious um, just to, to, to get it again now that we actually get to focus on None Without Sin. I mean, what an interesting concept. How did you hear about sin eating? How did you, I mean, I I imagine just hearing about it. You're like, Oh, I have to write a book about that. But I mean, what made you, what made you choose it as a topic? It's so fascinating. I, so I came across, this must've been 10 years ago. Um, I came across this article and it was just this short article and it was talking about how, you know, the, the, the I think the, the, the headline was something like, you know, the, the, you know, the worst career choice ever sort of thing, you know, and, <laughs> and it was just this, it was just this short historical article talking about sin eating and what it was, um, you know, when it happened and, and things like that. And it just kind of detailed all that stuff. And I was like, wow, this is a fantastic thing. I got to hang on to this. So, you know, I got a copy of the article and saved it and just kind of kept it there because like this would be to to me, it was like, this is something I just don't know what it is, but it's it'll be something. Sure. So I held on to it. And when I was sitting down to start looking at writing none without sin, it's like, okay, you know, I I had a couple of things in mind. I had, you know, a character, you know, my characters that I wanted to put use, um, but I was like, all right, what kind of element am I going to use for this? Why is this person killing people? You know, trying to put all the plots together. Mm-hmm. And that's when the Sin Eater just came back to me. And I was like, what would happen if, because uh, the concept of this of Sin Eating is, is just so old. Um, mm-hmm. And I was like, well, what if somebody used that as their, uh, their the calling card, you know, a killer? Yeah. And, and that just kind of got the, the things spiraling in my head. And, you know, just slowly became what, you know, what it ended up being uh, with None Without Sin. But it's it's just one of those concepts that I was just fascinated by it when I read it. And I just kept it in the back burner, kept it, you know, going back to it and th- reading it again and going, OK, what can I do with this? And it just took some time. It, it just took some time for the ideas to percolate. Um, and eventually they did. Yeah. I, I mean, 10 years is like, I feel like. Yeah. To have that concept sitting in your mind, it would have an impression on me too. <laughs> so that is really, really neat. And the, oh, wow. the interesting, I think the interesting thing is that, that so that concept or the, or the, or the, the ritual was mainly practiced, practiced in England and Wales in the Victorian era. Mm. But an interesting fact, the last known sin eater died early in the 20th century. 
Really? So even though the practice mostly died out um, after the Victorian era, there was still, it was still being practiced in little bits over in England um, here and there. And then the, the, the late, the last known person, you know, died in the 19, the early ni- 19, 1900s. Wow. That's so interesting. I mean, that really connects some interesting dots for me, just thinking about what was going on in the world at that time. And wow, that is so fascinating that I feel like every time when I was reading the book and I remember when we were talking about this the first time I sat for a couple hours after and I was just like, what a wild (laughs) thing to do with your time (laughs) and, and, uh, you know, to make a career out of it. It's just so, so fascinating. Oh, it, it had to be the worst. It had to be the worst career choice to make. I mean, you had to be so, you had to be so desperate and so low on the poverty level um, yeah. to set, you're essentially selling your soul to the, to, to whoever um, yeah. with the cons, you know, with this. And so the sin eater was definitely the, the absolutely worst career choice in history. Yeah. So. No kidding. Wow. That, I mean, I, I just am so fascinated about it as a, as a concept. I, I just kind of like <clears throat> sometimes feel the need to just sit and let it sink in. That is just so wild. But like you said, if you're very uh, low class, whatever, whatever, if you're low in the system uh, and you're desperate for money and maybe even if you're like, that can't be real, m- maybe that's the, the position for you. But just the idea <laughs> of it, having that label just feels like such a heavy weight it's we can move on but <laughs> it just is something that I have to ooh, <clears throat> to, to grapple with myself it's it's just so wild um so another question that I typically ask and especially since I've already asked you a lot of these questions about dead air it's very fun for me to get to hear what things are the same and different about none without sin your writing process did you feel like the writing process for this was very similar to dead air or to your other books um and what was the writing process in general so, so my writing process has evolved over my last four books uh my when my first book I was literally literally had no idea what I was writing I just <laughs> sat down and started I was I with the industry I think in the industry we would usually call it pantsing so you're yes. flying at the seat, seat you're writing at the, the seat of your pants and I, that's what I was yeah you know, when I wrote my first book it was it was just totally I just sat down and just started writing, had no idea where it was going to go or how it was going to end or what was going to happen. Um, with the second book, I, I had, I knew how I wanted it to begin and knew how it was going to end. And I just had to, I had to fill in the gaps in between. Dead Air was the first book where I started to um, do a little bit of plotting. So uh, I had maybe a third to a half of the plot um, outlined. And it was, it was really just a quick, one sentence, this, what happens in this chapter? One sentence, what happens in this chapter? One sentence. Mm. Um, and then the la- the second half of the book, I, I just, I, I started writing. And then the second half of the book, I just kind of continued to, to write without an outline. Yeah. Um, none without sin got much closer to having a finished outline mm. um, before I started writing. I think I got maybe a, three quarters of the way into an outline um, so my writing process has, has evolved and to the point now where what I'm writing is completely outlined. I've ah. outlined it from beginning to end. Um, and it, it does make things easier, believe it or not, knowing where sure. I'm going, uh, having some idea of where I'm headed. It, it actually has made the writing process easier. So I'll be interested to see how that continues to evolve over time. Yeah. Do you, so when you say you had three quarters of an outline, did you have mm. it? the first three quarters of the book or did you know how it was going to end? And it was just like mostly a fleshed out outline, but there were some missing pieces that you found yourself filling in as you were writing. What, what, what did that look like for you? Yeah. I usually have, um, I usually have an idea of how it's going to start and how it's going to end. Um, in, for instance, with dead air, I knew, I knew exactly the scene that was going to end the book. Well, I knew the scene that was going to end the, the climax of the book. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew it. I could visualize it. It was in my head. Um, and I had this scene in my head of how it was going to start. And for the most part, the start and the end of the, at the climax at the end of the book, those have remained pretty much close to the same 
way that I was, you know, had originally thought. None Without Sin um, started the same way that I had envisioned it. Uh, the ending it was a little bit different than what I had originally intended. Oh, interesting. Um, but it, it, for the most part, it, it still came out the way that I had headed the, the direction that I was going. And, you know, and, and even with the outlines, <clears throat> I reach a certain point where uh, when I get done the first draft and I go back, there's always there's always some veering off of from the outline as time as you go through and you you're continuing to write. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. Wow, this would be. You know, some idea strikes you that this would be something really great to put in here. This, <laughs> this little element would be nice to add this little subplot. Yeah. Um, so that always tends to pop up. So the plot, even if it's outlined, is never necessarily exactly the same as the finished book. Speaking of having to rewrite something that was maybe not initially what you'd intended, um, what was the hardest scene for you to write? We didn't ask that in the last interview, but I'm so curious what it was for <clears throat> None Without Sin. That is, that is a good question. Um, I'm trying to think about that. It's, it, it's, it's, it's one of those, you know, in dead air, there was definitely a scene that was very hard for me to write that I had to step away after I had to take a week off from writing when I was done writing it. Oh, wow. Um, but with none without sin, it flowed fairly well. Um, and I didn't feel like there was anything, any particular scene that was, too difficult um the climb the climax of the book is always challenging because you've got to get you know there's always a lot of action there's always a lot of excitement and you've got to get you got to get that right and flowing right um yeah. and the way you write that those scenes <clears throat> will have an impact on the pacing uh, and so forth so those scenes are always harder right because you know part of what they what what the experts say is when you're getting into a scene that has a fast pace and action, a fight scene, your sentence structure needs to shorten. You need to be very quick with your words and use, you know, mm -hmm. don't use long words, but cut your, your words down. And when you're writing a full climactic scene, which may span multiple chapters, that gets to be a very difficult task to do because you're so used to writing complex sentences and you grabbing, using, you know, a whole, you know, a whole library of words and then you get to two or three chapters where you where there's a lot of action and you feel like you've got to start really crunching everything, that you, every single word that you say. Um, and that gets difficult. It's a little different than like with Dead Air, where it was an emotional toll uh, with the scene that I wrote uh, that was the hardest one versus this, which was just which more of a logistical, logistical approach to writing the scene. Yeah. Huh. That makes a lot of sense. I'm curious, what was that scene for Dead Air, the one that made you walk away for a week? So there's there's a scene in Dead Air where the first, um, where the antagonist commits their first murder. Mm. And it, the scene is written, the scene is written in the first person point of view, present yes. point of view. So you're, the reader is experiencing it as the killer does. Sure. And there was a lot of sensations and a lot of mental challenges going on. And I had to go to a really dark place to kind of get into what that person would feel when they were committing that first crime. That's what would, right. what was the sensations, the blood on their hands? What was that, that feel like, you know, yeah. what was going through their head? That was difficult to write because I'm not typically like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you know, I, you, you had, I had to go to a dark place in order to really get deep into that character's mind. Sure. Well, that seems, I, I, now that you say it, that makes a lot of sense. And as you're talking about it, it, it's been a year and some change since I read Dead Air. And now I feel like I have to go back and read it again, because that was, <laughs> I remember as you're describing it to me now, I remember, I, I think I was listening to the audiobook as I was washing dishes and I had to stop washing dishes. And I just was like, wow, this is so <laughs> eerie in that it's very clear in in this person's perspective that they're having a good time <laughs> and and yeah that must have been so so challenging as someone who is not like that <laughs> yes. and I was just telling Gabe too 
Um, those kinds of things, I never thought I was much of like a, a, a gory, re- like someone who enjoyed reading the kind of gore. But I have really, we've had some books that are coming out being that it's spooky season that I was a little bit apprehensive to read. And, in, you know, None Without Sin being one of them just because it's along the same vein of, okay, I know it's going to be good, but that kind of... I, I remember how Dead Air had that moment of, of being in the perspective of the killer, which None Without Sin also had its changing perspectives. Uh, and I will, I want to get into that with you in a second too. But I remember that moment of, oh my gosh. <laughs> so, um, but I've actually been really enjoying it. I was telling, I never cease to be impressed with our authors. I feel like you guys just are professionals or something at making your readers feel a certain way. It was very, very, it's been very fun for me to get into all of these books. Um, because while even when I feel immersed in the like action or things that I would usually feel a little uncomfy with, it has been really, really rewarding to have those feelings at the end of the book to, to feel like, wow, I was really immersed in that story. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> um, and thank you for including it in Dead Air as well. Thank you for, 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 for both. And speaking of alternating perspectives, and I also mentioned that I'd listened to the audiobooks. Um, did you listen to the audiobook of None Without Sin? What was that like oh, for you? <laughs> absolutely. Um, I, I've, I've listened to, I've, I've listened to the audiobooks of Dead Air and None Without Sin. And it's always, I'm always a little apprehensive at first when I first start because as a writer, I have a certain a certain vision of what the character sounds like. Um, so I am always apprehensive that the narrator will or won't get that. Mm-hmm. You know, they won't they because you know they don't talk to me ahead of time and ask or anything like that. They you know they just go and they do their interpretation. So I'm always a little hesitant, a little little apprehensive about how that's going to sound. Dead Air, um, you know, she, she Rachel Fulginetti did such an incredible job with the audiobook. Um, and with she both got, she characters nailed, too. Oh my god! She gosh. nailed, yeah, she absolutely nailed Caitlin Ash's voice, and I was just so amazed. Uh, and and when I read, listened to None Without Sin, it was the same thing. The two narrators there um, got Candace's voice as well as Brian's voice, almost perfect. Yeah. Uh, so I was really really pleased. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we had been talking about, you know, alternating perspectives because we also got, um, I mean, we in, in, all, in both of the books of yours that I've read, we get perspectives from different people. Um, so what was that like for you, writing multiple perspectives in the story? Um, we talked a little bit about it when we did our Dead Air interview, but how about for None Without Sin? Because, you know, at least with Dead Air, you had some experience being a radio show host, as we've talked about. So this what, was this just a totally wild, different experience for you? What I mean, as an author, maybe not. What was it like? No, no not, not really. Um, I, I tend to like to write in the two perspectives. Um, you know, I feel like um, not that I don't like reading books that have a single perspective in them. I do. I, I love them. Um, but I feel like with the double perspective, dual perspective of, you know, of two characters from different, <clears throat> different lifestyles, different, you know, completely different people. And in some cases, people that don't even know each other at first, you know, like with None Without Sin, you know, Candace didn't know Brian and Brian didn't know Candace. Um, it gives a unique perspective. Um, it gave me the opportunity to place, it gave, for instance, in None Without Sin starts at a crime scene that the only way that I could put a perspective in in the crime scene was by using Candace. There's no way that the police would have allowed Brian as a journalist to just walk into a crime scene and start looking around. <laughs> so true. for me, it was Candace was the perfect vehicle for providing me some of that insight um, into some of the stuff that was going on, and particularly with the sin eating, because that was – originally when I was going to just originally I, you know, I had Brian in mind and, you know, although he's a globe trotting journalist or former globe trotting journalist, um, the sin eating concept is not very well known. Sure. Um, so how does he find out about it? I mean, if I just have him know it, then it makes him look like a know-it-all. So I had to feel, <laughs> find some way to introduce that into the story. And, and for me, it was like, all right, well, 
why not I have why don't I have a, a priest or minister who heard about it, you know, in seminary? I mean, is in a history class or something. Mm. That's the perfect way to introduce this very obscure concept um, into the story, yeah. as well as giving me giving the reader insight and perspectives that they normally wouldn't get with just a single point of view. Sure. Well, it's so interesting that I I don't even now that you've voiced it this way, I don't even know how to express what my assumption was ahead of time, but. It felt so natural to have Candace be, uh, you know, a, a former or, you know, Episcopal priest, you know, former is questionable, <laughs> but um, it, it just made so much sense to me that I guess maybe I had assumed that you had gone in with the knowledge that she had to be that, but it's interesting that it almost sounds like the opposite that you kind of had this character that you were like, okay, how would it make sense for her to be here without her being a detective, which, you know, is, is not really what you were trying to do. So that it, it's just, yeah, I don't know if I voiced what my um, former conception was, but that is so interesting because I feel like that is just different than what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> Well, Brian, Brian was a character um, that I actually created probably about 10 or 15 years ago when I had just started writing. Okay. Fact, it was the, the, the character of Mildred and Jessica um, and um, the, the, the police detective. They were all characters that I had written a couple bad short stories about years and years ago when I was first getting into writing and I just loved that, the, that group of people. I, I really lo- loved the, the, the quirkiness of Mildred and Jessica. I liked Brian a lot, but I just never could find a good vehicle to put them all in. And that's when, when I started looking at plotting out none with that sin, I said, this is it, this is where I'm going to put Brian. But then it was the question, okay, where do I, you know, where do I, how do I get the sin eater element in? How do I get, you know, do I, who, who do I make a, the second point of view? And that's where Candace came from. Mm-hmm. So Brian's been around with me for a long, long time. Wow. Oh, that is really, really neat. And I love that you were like, oh, I'm so attached to this character. I want to bring him up in a different way. Just as someone who is not a writer, um, but who gets to talk to writers as the best job ever for a living. I'm always so fascinated to hear how characters came to be, especially ones that are so clearly characterized. I I feel like there's no other word for it. Just, you know, such developed characters and that it just, it, it pulls some special heartstrings for me to know that, Brian has been around with you for a long time. He he he's a full grown teenager of a of an idea at this point. It sounds like so that is just really really neat. Um, we're gonna switch gears a little bit again, but I do uh, I don't remember if I asked you this question way back when I interviewed you the first time. But this is a question that we've been asking people, and it's probably one of my favorite questions to ask people is um, if your book. If none without sin specifically were to be made into a movie, do you know who you would cast? Did we ask this question for dead air as well? I, I don't remember. I don't remember if we if we asked or not. It, it, and it's but it, but it's always a, it's it's it, people have asked it before, and uh, and, uh-huh. and I'm, I'm never I, I never seem to have an answer for some reason. Um, but but so if if I'm looking at everything, if I'm looking at everybody, um, I think if if it wanted to be um, true to the character, I would probably for Brian, this, this person's not an actor. That's the thing. That's okay. I would probably, I would probably say, say David Muir from ABC news because he is the huh. inspiration for Brian. Um, wow. he was the inspiration for Brian years and years ago. You know, when I, I was like, you know, he would make, you know, I started putting Brian together and I'm like, you know, I modeled him to a certain degree off of David Muir. Now, David's not an actor, so I don't know. If, uh, but, uh, yeah, I think he would probably be, the, if anybody, I would, the person I would choose to, 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 to play Brian. Candace, hmm, I would probably have to say Daisy Ridley. Oh, um, okay. I think she would be, um, 
probably the, uh, a good candidate for the role without her English accent, of course. Of course. <laughs> uh, so, you know, um, I think I would probably maybe want to see her in the role. I could. Now, it's so funny because I feel like I say this every time, but it's always true. Or I I would say maybe it's true about 75% of the time. Now that you say it, I can't see anyone else. (laughs) But but when you said the name Daisy Ridley, I was like, interesting choice. And now I'm as my wheels are turning, I'm like, yes, it has to be Daisy Ridley. Of course, it can't be anybody else. Well, I I think, you know, for me, it's like... um, when I'm trying to find someone like that, you know, I'm asked that question. I'm thinking about somebody. Um, if if I saw her, if I looked at pictures of her from like when it's from Star Wars or from some of the other movies she's been in, I would probably go. Eh. But if I look at pictures of her from her upcoming film, the uh, Marsh King's daughter, mm. that she looks to me, she just I'm like, oh, my God, that's Candace. Um, you know, it's, it really cool. just depends on, to me, it depends on, you know, how they make what her up. she's, how, yeah, how they make her up and how they make her look. Yeah. That's so interesting. I'm curious too. And, and this is kind of out of left field. So if you need a second to think about it, go for <laughs> it. But, um, I really loved Agatha <laughs> as a character and I'm wondering oh, if you yeah. have an idea <laughs> of, uh, mm, of what she would wow. look like. Oh, um, Oh gosh, you know I'm not really sure. Um, That's totally the, okay. The, I know the, I kind of threw first, that in the, there. There's, there's a there's a British actress that comes to mind. Um, I can't remember her name. Um, I'm ever, I just saw her um, in in a show I was watching last night on one of the streaming services, and then she would, the, uh, which I don't remember what her name is, but that woman might might be a good role for a good person for Agatha. But I never. I, you know, I rarely, even when I'm writing characters, I rarely think about who they might be and who they might not be. Yeah, I was so fascinated by Agatha. I thought she was such a fun ad. I don't know if she was one of the characters you kind of knew was going to be there from the beginning, but I just loved her character. Father Blake was was really fun to read. Obviously not my favorite character for <laughs> for reasons, but um, but I, I thought that they were both really interesting characters that I enjoyed reading about, even though I'm very partial to Agatha. <laughs> and, it, and, it's, and it's funny. It's funny that you should say that because they're side characters. You know, they they they're characters that probably will not exist beyond that book. I sure. mean, you know, Mildred, Mildred and Jessica and, and Mick, you know, and Brian and even Candace, they're going to exist beyond this book. You know, in other books. Sure. But oh wow, really? Some of these side characters that you don't really, some of the side characters you don't really, you know, think about. Um, you know, end up, you know, being some of the characters that people just absolutely love. Isn't that funny? I always, whenever I get drawn to a side character or hear about someone thinking, oh, that character is my favorite and they never even crossed my mind. It's, it's just such a fun little thing for me. You just mentioned Brian and Jessica and Mildred and some of the, you know, main characters might make their way into other things. Do you have plans for them? I, I just finished the first draft of the of uh, the next book with Brian and Candace and the rest of oh the my crew. Gosh. I'm, I'm, I'm in I'm in the process of working through the second draft now. So, well, that's perfect because I was going to ask you next what are you working on and, and if there was going to be a, a sequel to None Without Sin. So the answer sounds kind of like yes. Is it yep. a proper sequel or is it more just like here they it's, are doing a new thing? Yeah, it's 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 here. They are doing a new thing. It, okay. it doesn't. I mean, it picks the book picks up um, about four or five months after um, the events of None Without Sin, and there's a new mystery for them to solve. Mm. Um, you know, th- th- hopefully, if 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 everything goes right, that the, the book will be called uh, Dig Two Graves, um, and you know, it, give, it it actually will put Candace more in the hot seat as far as being the detective because mm. Brian is missing. Oh. I'm very excited to read that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that'll be so neat. Okay. I, I'm already on the edge of my seat for that one. <laughs> I remember when you had, um, when we had you on last time, you had already finished None Without Sin and it was in Cam Cat's clutches, essentially. You know, it was in the process of, of coming out. And now it, I mean, 
I don't know if I can wait that long <laughs> to, to, to read. It's you. You said I'm, digging to grave. I'm always looking for beta. Re- I'm always looking for beta readers. So you know, see when I get when I get to the point where I'm, I'll, I'll happily send it over to you to read. You'll be like one of the first people to actually see it. So don't 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 <laughs> tell me that. <laughs> I I will get way too excited about it. I always I'm always telling even you know outside of work I'm always like that Michael Bradley. You know, all my friends know who you are because I just am so in love with your books and and the things that you do and and having you as one of our first authors, you know, for CamCat in general, but you know, for for me as an interviewer, and um, you just you you have a very special place in my heart. Your books have a very special place in my heart. Um, I feel like we're friends, um, so I always have a great time chatting with you. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. I'm. I'm- Blushing. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, before we let you go, I have my question that we ask all of our authors, which is, um, what are you reading now? I, I'm reading right now, um, actually listening to uh, an audiobook about Billy the Kid. So um, it, it's a historical, it's nonfiction, obviously. And um, so I'm just, I'm probably th- three quarters of the way done with that. Okay. Um, and then I'll, you know, I'll have to find something else. I'll probably go back to reading a mystery after this. I tend to fluctuate between nonfiction and mysteries, thrillers, and suspense. Mm. Um, I'll, I usually I'll get into the, this mood for a, you know, a, a nonfiction book, and then I'll jump in and read that. And uh, so right now it's a it's a book called Billy the Kid. Uh, yeah. So. I think I've and heard. In case you didn't figure one. out, it's about Billy the Kid. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I've just heard of Billy the Kid, and then you know, any sort of yeah. media that is about him, I would just know from knowing of the of the person. <laughs> um, that is that is great. Um, I'm also similarly someone who likes to jump into nonfiction and then jump into fiction when I'm just in the mood for whichever one. So I understand the, the, the pull and the desire. Um, well, we have reached the end of our time together. Where can our audience find you if they want to stay up to date with what you're up to? So uh, I, you can find me on my website at uh, mbradleyonline.com. I'm also on Facebook and um, Instagram and now on threads as well uh, with uh, at MJ Bradley 88. So all three across all three platforms. The reds. Is that a new, is that a new platform now that we have to (laughs) all be up to date with? Oh gosh. That's a new one. Yep. Oh boy. Well, and when this comes, I mean, this is coming out very soon, but by the time this comes out, hopefully I will be on it and, uh, and, and be more familiar with it for the future. Michael, thank you so much for coming on with us. As always, it was such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yes. So much fun. And to the listeners at home, you can find none without sin and dead air in ebook, audiobook, and print formats on our website, camcatbooks.com, or wherever books are sold. You can listen to Camcat Unwrapped on all major podcast platforms or watch us on our YouTube channel. And make sure you follow us on social media at Camcat Books. Thank you all once again so, so, so much for tuning in and unwrapping another one of our books to live in with me. My name is Jess, and I will see you all next time here on Camcat Unwrapped.